In his new book, Intellectuals and Race, renowned author and economist Thomas Sowell explores the ideas that high-profile figures have had about race and multiculturalism throughout history. And in this new book, Sowell breaks new ground on a variety of racial issues and examines why race relations in America today are the way they are. Joining us now to talk much more about his book, his author and economist, and frankly, hero to many, Thomas Sowell. Ms. Sowell, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, multiculturalism has not only taken root in schools, I think it is uncritically accepted by a lot of Americans, haven't thought it through. In this book, you, you assault it head on. You describe it as a barrier to progress and a lot of other things. Explain why multiculturalism, if you would, is bad. I guess it starts from a false premise, uh, which is that there's something uh, that, all, that all cultures are equal in some undefinable sense, which has never been the case. I mean, some cultures are better at some things, worse at other things, uh, and at particular times in history, uh, one group's culture may be ascendant and another time in other groups, but what you almost never see is what they assume is a norm, namely all groups performing pretty much the same in all kinds of fields across the board. That, you, you, you can go through centuries of history without finding a single example of that. You, you say that that assumption, in fact, holds different groups down. You write, quote, multiculturalism, like the caste system, paints people into the corner where they happen to have been born, but at least the caste system doesn't claim to benefit those at the bottom. A absolutely. So when the multiculturalists say, for example, that uh, the school should not try to uh, uh, make uh, black students uh, speak standard English, uh, the difference between speaking standard English and not speaking standard English can be huge in terms of your, your job, your careers, and all sorts of other things. So uh, tell me how it's changed. You, you've had a remarkable academic career. You've written 35 books. You've taught at the most prestigious universities in the world. I don't think you grew up in a family where that was going to be expected. I don't think your dad was a, a college professor. How was your education different from the education kids are receiving now? I get oh, oh that it was better. That's the that's the straight answer. Uh, I went to school in Harlem, but if you even if you went to school in Harlem in the 1940s and you were in one of the better classes because they did have ability grouping throughout the system, uh, you got a very good education that would enable you to go anywhere. Uh, some years ago, someone at Forbes uh, try, uh, said that uh, it was remarkable that I come out of the ha Harlem schools and went on to these uh, universities. Uh, it was not that unusual. In fact, someone who uh, lived about three blocks from me in Harlem sent me a letter that said, my gosh, in this uh, one tenement, you know, we had a college professor, a priest, a doctor, and a lawyer uh, when, when, when this fellow was growing up. So this was not that unusual. Now, those avenues upward are simply not there. Now, but what, what was the difference, if you could put a, put a point on it? How was your, what did your teachers teach you or not teach you that allowed you, and it sounds like other people on your block, not a rich area, to succeed? First of all, they, they taught us the English language. Uh, they taught us uh, the standard academic subjects. They were not teaching us, uh, you know, uh, tree hugging. Uh, they were not teaching us how to use condoms. Uh, they were not teaching us to be victims. Uh, and they held us to the same standards that they held other kids to. Now, those of us who came from uh, homes where there were no, no, no truly educated people, uh, it was a little harder on us. But that's nothing compared to how hard it was going to be if they had made allowances and lowered the standards for us. Yes. This book is packed with all kinds of interesting information that I had never heard before. This really jumped out at me. You talk about the grotesque, really, disparity between black and white unemployment rates. The black unemployment rate is much higher than the white unemployment rate, but you say that wasn't always the case. You say black labor force participations were higher than that of whites up until about 1930. How, what yes. changed? Well, what changed was that the government intervention in the labor market. 1930 was the last year in which there was no federal minimum wage. Uh, they, they brought in the Davis-Bacon Act. In fact, people, some of the sponsors of the Davis-Bacon Act uh, said that they were produ producing that act precisely because uh, blacks from the South construction workers were coming up north and the construction companies were able to underbid the northern companies and uh, get government contracts. And so this was meant to put a stop to that. Amazing. So just to be totally clear, up until 1930, under the Roosevelt administration, and, or I, of course that would have been the Hoover administration, but up until that point, there were 
lower unemployment rates in black neighborhoods than white neighborhoods. And that has been the result, do you think, of lack not, of government intervention? Not, not always, but in 1930, that was certainly the case. And that was not the first time that it was the case. The, the, the huge uh, gap that you see today, that all has occurred under minimum wage laws. Huh, remarkable. What's the future of affirmative action? You write at some length about that. Will it continue? Oh, good. Uh, it, it all depends upon whether the Supreme Court wants to give a clear uh, decision one way or the other, or whether they want to do what they've been doing now for more than 30 years, saying pious things so that you, you can't have quotas, but then leaving wiggle room so that you really can have quotas, so long as you don't call them quotas. Huh. Do, you, do you think you often hear people say, well, affirmative action may be unfair, but it's helped a lot of people. You buy that? Uh, it may have helped some people, but on, on net balance, I don't believe it has. There's a marvelous uh, uh, study done uh, showing that when they banned, un uh, when they bl banned affirmative action in California, uh, University of California system, uh, blacks began to uh, graduate at a much higher rate than before, graduate with much uh, higher grade point average, graduated in subjects like math and engineering to a far greater extent than before because now the students went to those particular parts of the university system that fitted their particular academic preparation and they graduated before you know you could flunk out of Berkeley or UCLA right. which does you no good now you can graduate from Davis or, or Santa Cruz and, and, and go on to a career Amazing. Fascinating. Thomas Sowell, thanks so much for joining us. The book is Intellectuals and in Race and Well Worth Reading. Thanks very much. Thank you.